Welcome, I'm Jeffrey De Smit and I'm going to show you how to use artificial intelligence in Kotlin. More particularly, I'm going to show you how to use planning optimization AI, and uh, which is one of the most profitable areas of artificial intelligence, I would um, argue. So um, let's take a look at uh, how we're going to do that. Let's get started. And uh, so I'm going to build you an application from scratch and more particularly I'm going to build you this application from scratch where um, as we press the solve button over here um, it's going to uh, assign these lessons uh, such as English, Chemistry and Math to uh, time slots and to uh, rooms, rooms A, B and C and so forth. And we're going to make sure that no student has two, two lessons at the same time, no teacher has two lessons at the same time and so forth. So we're going to build some constraints into that and we're going to use an AI algorithm to schedule that for us to do the hard work for us right so um, you might wonder why is this a difficult problem well uh, imagine we have four lessons here math chemistry French and history we need to assign these to these four slots uh, room A room B and uh, those two time slots and uh, we need to make sure that um, math and chemistry uh, which have the same uh, which are being taught to the same student group ninth grade um, are not happening at the same time, of course, because those students cannot be in two places at the same time. Same thing applies for French and history, two different uh, uh, lessons, but and again, the same student group. Um, and also, chemistry and French are both taught by Marie Curie, so they have the same teacher, different student group, but same teacher, which should also not be happening at the same time, of course, right? And so we're going to write a Kotlin application and this Kotlin application will give this to problem to OptoPlanner and OptoPlanner will uh, solve this. So OptoPlanner is a constraint optimization engine, uh, which I'll be explaining a bit uh, more about later. Um, and so this is the, the solution. Now we can see that we, uh, that Matt and the ninth grade can follow both the math and chemistry lesson. The 10th grade can follow both lessons. And of course, Marie can actually, uh, actually teach both lessons to uh, first French and then chemistry, right? So that's the challenge. That's the AI algorithm we're going, and we're going to use an AI algorithm to solve this for us. Now these kinds of planning problems are all across the world. And so we're going to use the OptoPlanner to use that. And you might, and there's more of these kinds of planning problems. For example, when you're scheduling equipment, such as hospital beds, uh, rental cars, CAT scanners, and all kinds of other things, um, the more you can optimize those kinds of schedules under the constraints when people need to use those things, and under constraints in which combinations you might have of them, uh, you can actually improve the utilization of those things, uh, right? So basically save uh, a lot of money and also ecological foot footprint. Same thing for job shop scheduling, when you might manufacturing things, for example, cars, furnitures or books or things like, things like that. Some of the jobs you can do um, in parallel, others you cannot. For some of the jobs you need particular resources available, such as machines or people, and uh, with particular skills or um, um, abilities, and you need to make sure that that all fits into a plan that actually is executable, a feasible plan. And you want to reduce the mix span, uh, again, right, to improve efficiency. Um, another case is the vehicle routing problem, very f uh, famous problem, uh, where we need to assign uh, a number of vehicles to, to, to drive across the country to a number of locations. And we need to decide which vehicles goes to which location and, so f and in which order they do that. Now, um, we have this in production for uh, tens of thousands of vehicles, um, for example, for technician scheduling. And what we saw is we could actually, over the old system, over the non-AI systems or more uh, immature AI systems, we could be actually reduce the drive -all time year over year by 25%. 25% less uh, driving time. That resulted in um, massive uh, financial uh, savings, of course, as you can imagine, as well as massive, massive uh, fuel consumption reductions, um, which saves up to, which saves over 10 millions of kilograms of CO2 a year, actually, in that case. So um, vehicle routing is definitely one of the most profitable uh, AI cases you can solve. Um, then there's bin packing, where we assign processes to machines. Um, or other kinds of bin packing, all right? And um, there's also employee rostering. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, it's basically assigning uh, people to shifts and we need to take into account those, the wishes of those, those people as well as their skill sets and affinities, right? Um, and it's, the goal basically is to make them as happy as possible, uh, given of course the constraints that our, um, our hospital or our organizations or, or whatever the case may be still needs to keep rolling. Um, this is not. This is actually applies for any employees that are not working uh, nine to five, not just uh, nurses and doctors, also uh, guards um, and um, you know and any kind of 
uh, standby technicians as well as in, uh, and so forth, right? So um, to, without further ado, let's get coding. So how are we going to code this today? Um, well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to build this application. So a, um, a browser interface connects through JSON to a REST service. Um, it will be a Quarkus application and um, it's going to connect to a relational database to store the information um, the, of those lessons and so forth and OptiPanner will optimize those. Now, um, just to know, we're going to use Kotlin for to implement this, but you could do this in Java too. So the, 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 there is no requirement. You can you can choose whatever you like most. And also, um, if you, we are going to use Quarkus today, but you can also use Spring Boot to do this, of course, uh, too. But um, we really like Quarkus and I'm going to show you some, some of the advantages of Quarkus uh, during this presentation too. Okay, let's get started, the project setup. So we're going to set up Quarkus and with the REST service. So um, we're going to go to code.quarkus.io and generate our application. So um, I've got this open up here already. This is code.quarkus.io. And let me just increase the font a bit. That's a bit too much. Okay, and let's see what do we want. First of all, we're going to give our application a name. We're going to call it the timetabling application. I like building to Maven, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, and I'm going to use a REST application, yes. And I'm going to use REST E, and I'm going to expose uh, this, the information through JSON to our uh, UI. And so uh, we'll use Jackson to do that for us. So REST is Jackson. Um, on top of that, what else do we need? We're going to use Kotlin, right? So let's get Kotlin involved. Here we go. And let's get, um, we're going to use Hibernate with Kotlin. So let's get the Hibernate with Kotlin and Panache involved too. Panache is basically some improvements on top of Hibernate to make it easier to use. Um, so what else do we need? Um, if you use a database, well, if you use Hibernate, we want to go to a database. So we need a database. Um, I'm going to use the H2 database here. Uh, why that uh, is an in-memory database, so that's going to make it very easy. I don't need to run any other processes. I don't need to have anything, any daemon running on my machine. So uh, I'm just going to go for that. Um, and of course, we need uh, some OptoPlanner for the AI part. So we use the OptoPlanner AI Constraint Solver and the Jackson bindings, uh, as we'll send some of the information back to the UI also. Um, I think this is my shopping list. It's time to get started, so let's generate the application. This will download a zip for us. Here it is, timetabling zip. Um, let's open it. Here we go. We are going to extract this into my demo directory. Here we go. I'm going to show the files. Let me close up uh, this one. All right. And this one can close too. Uh, here we go. Here we have it set up. Uh, well, here we have the thing. So this is the timetabling um, zip we just got. Uh, there's the POM file, you can see, hmm, I'm not sure why this says yesterday. Hmm, okay, weird. Um, anyway, um, and we're going to open this POM file with uh, IntelliJ. So let's take a look. I'm going to open IntelliJ. I'm going to say, IntelliJ, please open me a project. And uh, we're going to use this one over here. I'm going to open it as a project. There we go. It's opening it up. So I'm loading a bit. This is, of course, in presentation mode, so you can follow up earlier. It's resolving the dependencies. While it's doing this, let's open this POM file it has over here. So this is the one generated from code.quarkus.io. Um, okay. It's a bit stuck, so it's probably just downloading the sources. Uh, here we go. Yep, there it is. And so we're going to use Java 11, as you can see here. We're going to use the Scotland version. We're going to use Quarkus 181. That's the version that, um, that's the latest version. So that's, of course, what code is coded Quarkus.io gives us. Um, and then here's our shopping list we had an early, a moment earlier, which is the rest easy stuff for the rest stuff, which is together with checks and stuff. The order is a bit strange here, though. Uh, we do have OptoPlanner in there, as you can see, you know, OptoPlanner itself and then the Quarkus integration, uh, the H2 thing we ask for. So maybe it's basically it's all there. Um, what do we get on top of that? We get some uh, Kotlin sources, like an example resource. Um, not really what I was looking for. And we get some tests. 
Um, I'm going to throw away the tests for today um, as uh, I don't want this video to run too late. So, um, uh, but of course you should be doing tests and of course here's how you can, you can see how you can do it. And if you look at the source codes of this example, you, uh, of the full example behind this, um, after you, you finish this video, you'll see that there's tests in there too. So uh, please do that. Anyway, today no tests. Um, okay, so let's continue. We have our thing run. Let's first see if we can actually get this rolling. So I'm going to open up the console and I'm going to do maven quarkus dev. Maven quarkus dev, right? And this will actually start up the quarkus development mode for us. And during the rest of this video, I will no longer, I will not touch Maven again, right? I will not touch the command line again. Um, I will just make changes, including changes in the pom file or any of the classes. And you will see that uh, Quarkus will pick those up in less than a second, actually, in less than a second. So um, let's show that. I'm here and I'm going to go to localhost, all right? Here we go. This is, and of course, this is still set on the high. Resolution. Let's bring it normal. Uh, so this is our our standard Quarkus thing, and if you actually look into that, we see that's um, in the resources. That's this resource over here. And let me just throw that away for a second, right? And refresh this, and then we get a 404, right? Nothing in there. Uh, we do say that these are the REST services available. This is the Hello World REST service that they gave us already. Let's take a look at that example resource. That's this one, a path of hello world, right? So um, I'm going to rename that a bit. I want to, I want something that returns me a timetable. So let's rename this to a timetable. All right, here we go. And change the URL timetable. And we're going to say that this uh, is not uh, media type JSON, but uh, uh, not media type strings, but application JSON. We're going to do that for the entire uh, REST resources. And similarly, I'm going to make sure that what uh, it, uh, it consumes is also JSON. So we're only going to communicate in JSON anymore. So I'm just going to specify all that here. And let's take a look now. Um, here we have our function, hello. And um, basically uh, it's, it's going to, you know, we, were, we will want, and this is the getter of that, right? So we will want this to return a timetable um, we're just going to do it like this, time table, and open this up, remove that. So we don't have a timetable class yet, um, so I'm just going to make a quick domain for that. Let me create a package, domain package, I'm just going to create a domain object called timetable for now, time, uh, not in Java, this is a Kotlin thing of course, Kotlin, in the class called timetable okay and um we're just going to put in a, a name here for now uh you know a name string which is hello uh, or maybe something else like um hi kotlin kotlin right uh, of course this is a bar and we're going to use this in the timetable over here and we're just going to have this return uh, timetable here we go now we go back we don't touch the terminal here we just go back here to the browser click refresh and um, we get now of course look there's this timetable thing so let's actually go there let's actually go to slash timetable and what you see is we get our JSON version of this uh, high cotton thing right okay now um, Okay, we have Quarkus set up. Uh, let's do something domain specific, right? So we're going to create the timetable class diagram, uh, the, the, the domain model, right? So in our domain model, what do we need? We need time slots and rooms. That's where we're going to assign our lessons to. And um, so our time slots will be for a particular day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. Notice there's no date there. It's purely Monday, Tuesday, Friday, or, 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 or and so forth. Um, and it will have a certain start time and an end time. So for example, from 8.30 to 9.30 is the first class, uh, first time slot, and then the second one is 9.30 uh, to 10.30 and so forth, right? We'll also have a room object, uh, which is like room A or room B. And then of course, we're going to have our lessons, which will have a subject such as math or chemistry, a teacher such as Marie Curie, and a student group such as 9th grade or 10th grade. 
And the interesting thing is these lessons, we will need to assign them to a time slot and to a room, but that's the AI part, that's the OptiPanner part, who will actually assign us to those, those things. So we will start those out as NULL. So let's code these things in Kotlin. So um, here we go. We are uh, we will create a, a Kotlin class here for our time slot. That was the first class. Uh, time slot. And so our time slot has a late init var of day of week. Now why late init? is because um, if it comes from the database, then Hibernate will fill it in for us. Um, and if we create it for test, well, test data creation, we will actually create a constructor for it. So um, late init is actually a good, a good approach here. Um, and we're going to do the same for the um, start time, which is a local time. And um, here we go. And we're going to do this, and we're also going to create an end time right back as we saw a minute ago. Um, so um, I'm going to create this, an explicit constructor for those three things. You might imagine that we could add these here on the top, uh, but I actually want two constructors. So I'm just going to add an empty constructor too. So we now have two constructors, one to fill in these three things and one which is just empty. This is the one used by Hibernate as well as uh, yeah, Hibernate just for this case actually. Um, and this is the one we'll use when we want to create, start creating test data. Okay. Um, so let's create the room class. Here we go, we have a room class. Um, we're going to do very similar things here. So we're going to say a late init var of the name of the room. And we're going to add a, a constructor for that, which just has that that uh, that name as a constructor. So the room could the name could be room A, room B, and stuff like that. And of course, we're going to create a non-empty constructor again for Hibernate. Um, both of these things will later actually also end up in the database, um, but I'll, I'll worry about that. And so we'll we'll need an ID too, but I'll worry about that in a minute. Let me just start. Let me just continue like this first. So. We're going to need a lesson class. What is our lesson? Our lesson has a late, uh, late init var of the actual subject, all right, which is going to be a string. Um, we have, an, um, we have the, the teacher, all right, and we have the uh, student uh, group, which is also going to be a string. Okay, here we go. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, we need to assign these lessons to a time slot and to a room. So let's start by assigning them to a time slot. And so this is of the time slot type. Now these actually start out as NULL. So we will, while we, when we create the test data, they will not be assigned yet and yet they will go into the database. So we're going to actually have to use a question mark here in, uh, right, because they can be null. Same thing for the room. Um, this, uh, variable uh, will be null in the beginning and will be stored with annuals in the database and uh, will, will exist for a while until OptiPlan comes around and actually assigns them. Um, for test data generation, I will want to have a constructor later on, uh, which just has those these three fields here. And of course, uh, because uh, this is going to go in Hibernate, we need an empty constructor. And in fact, we also need this one for OptiPlanner because OptiPlanner will, will, will need to be able to create lessons too. We'll, we'll get to back to that in a minute. Okay, now let's hook these. So we now we have a lesson, a room, and a time slot class, but we will actually have multiple lesson instances that, uh, that will need to be assigned, math, chemistry, and so forth, for example, multiple rooms and multiple time slots. And so we will want to keep all of that together somewhere. And that's where I'm going to make that timetable. Timetable is the, um, uh, you know, one data set, one, one, one school's problem, right? And your application might be handling multiple schools, but you know, each school has one timetable. And that's one thing that needs to be solved in, in, its, in, in the whole, you know, it's, it's unbreakable to be solved actually. Well, you could partition it, but it's not a good idea. Um, anyway, so let's take a look what we want to do here. Uh, we want to here, we, in the timetable, we want to have a list of all the possible time slots. So here we go, time slot list. All right, uh, we make a time slot list. We're going to make a room list too. 
uh, which is a list of all the rooms in this uh, school and we're going to make a lesson list too which is a list of all the lessons in this school okay now um, let's make a constructor for that uh, right for a test data thing later on uh, here we go and let's also do an empty one uh, actually this is the one that Optaplan will need this thing will not go into the database so um, for for, from, um, for them it's less, for Hibernate it's not really needed. Let's go back to our timetable resource. As you can see, I made a spelling mistake, so let me fix that, our timetable resource. In fact, if we are consistent, this T should be capital because the timetable there has a capital. Okay, and um, here we're just going to add um, three empty lists for now, right? Uh, not list of list, but list of, of course. I always get this wrong. Um, we're just going to add three empty lists in there and if we now jump back to our UI over here uh, yes, to our UI and ask for this resource let's take a look what we get we get three empty lists so far so good right um, okay so what's the next thing uh, the next thing is we need to uh, add this stuff into the database all of this needs to be database uh, aware right so um, let's start with the time slot again. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an at entity annotation on this, you uh, know, for Hibernate, which will immediately complain because there is no ID. So we're going to add an ID. Uh, let's, let me first add the ID. The ID is a var ID long question mark to null. Uh, why it will start out as null and then Hibernate, once it goes into the database, will fill it up for us. But it will live a while until it hit, actually hits the database. Um, so this for Hibernate is its ID and we're going to have the value generated automatically. So we don't need to worry about that. Um, I'm going to copy paste this ID approach for all uh, for all three things that go into the database. So the time slot goes into the database, the room goes into the database. So we need an add entity annotation on this. Right, and the lesson needs to go into the database. Let's add the lesson into the database too. Okay, great. So now, um, oh, and of course, Hibernate says, uh, or at least IntelliJ helps us here, says, okay, the entity um, has an ID, that, that's the ID here. These fields I can figure out on my own because they're just strings, so that will go into var chars into the database. Uh, but what about this these? Because, you know, what, what's time slot, right? So we will need to tell them that, that this is a many to one relationship, right? We need to tell Hibernate JPA that. Same for the room, it's a many to one relationship. One lesson, uh, you know, multiple lessons can be in the same time slot, multiple lessons can be in the same room, as long as they're not in the same time slot in the same room at the same time, it's all fine, right? Okay. Um, and if they are, we still need to be able to represent it in the database. It's just not a feasible schedule anymore. So, um, so far so good. Uh, we will not put a timetable in the database, but we will want to fetch it from the database. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to create a persistence uh, part, persistence um, and uh, domain um, package. And in this, I am going to create a, a repository for these things. So let's start with oh, not Java, uh, force of habit, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm going to create a, a time slot uh, uh, repository here, all right? And here we go, we have a time slot repository. And this is going to be uh, a Panache repository. So Panache, as you, as you probably noticed when I selected things for Hibernate, uh, that's actually the helper things on top of Hibernate to make this much easier. And so if you just say that this is for a time slot, all right, then I, let me just show you what we get for free out of this. If you actually then just say, okay, uh, what are the methods of, so we, all the kinds of methods we get out of this, we get a whole bunch of stuff like um, deleting, counting, finding, and then so forth and so forth and so forth. Um, anyway, let's, con let's get back to our code. So this is basically, um, for those who are familiar with the DAO pattern, an automatic DAO for us, right? We will do the same for uh, the room and the lesson. So let me just create those two. Um, let me just say, okay, here we go. We're going to create one for the room. All right. 
repository. All right, that's again a Panache repository for room this time. There we go. And we're going to create one for um, the lesson, the lesson repository. There we go. Uh, okay, I forgot. Okay, forgot to click the right thing there. So um, here we go, and that's one for the lesson, right? So now we have those, um, we can actually ask, if we have an instance of these, we can actually just ask, you know, give me your find methods, give me your delete methods, your add methods and stuff like that. We still need to expose them to be able to use in dependency, inject them into other bits of our, like in the table, timetable resource. So we're going to have to add that this our application scoped, right? And so the lesson repository, the uh, room repository, all of them are application scoped, which basically means there's one instance of them and we can just, um, and then we can reuse, we can inject them in things. So we will, for example, uh, inject them in the timetable resource over here. So here we're going to say, I'm going to inject the, uh, the late init var of the timetable uh, repository, the, uh, time slot repository. There we go, all right. Um, which basically means that this time slot uh, repository which we created here, which is application scoped, will be injected in here. And we will then be able to use that over here. So here we will be able to say, um, here we need to give a list of time slots, right? So we can just say time slot repository and uh, just uh, list all of them, right? Uh, we should probably also sort them, but I'm not going to do that right now, right? So now we actually create, now we actually give back the timetable with all of the time slots from the database and not just an empty list. Similarly, uh, we will do, of course, an, an, an inject of um, the room repository, uh, which is uh, a room repository. There we go. All right. And over there, we will again do a list, a list all of. All right. So still no compilation error, so that's, that's, uh, that's good. And we will inject the um, late init var for the lesson repository. I'm not sure why it's again proposing the other one, but anyway, please give me a lesson repository. And we're going to do a list of all of that too, right? Okay, so let's see if that still works. We go over here, we crash the refresh button, there's a refresh button. Internal server error. Hmm. Go go go. Um, the null pointer exception. That 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 doesn't sound quite 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 good, right? Um, so why is that? Um, <laughs> uh, the null pointer. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, because we don't have our database set up yet. Of course not. Um, so we need to go into the application properties and actually make sure that our database is set up. So we need to tell Quarkus, okay, Quarkus, um, I would really like to have a data source of the DB kind of for H2. Right? And I would really like that data source. Um, so I need to give it the UDBC URL, GDBC URL and the GDBC URL uh, all right, it's going to be uh, DBC um, H2 because we're using that type of database, mem because we're going to use it in memory, and I'll, I'll give it a school time tabling, time tabling name that, that matters less. Um, and the problem is that um, we need to also make sure that Hibernate generates the timetable. Uh, for us, right? And uh, the, the schedule, the, the DLL schedule in the database for us. So what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to say, okay, database, database um, generation is drop and create. So let's take a look now. We go back to over here, we press refresh, and that looks much better, right? So now it actually goes to the H2 database fetches all of the time slot and rooms and lessons in there, which are none, <laughs> brings those back, 
so, and gives us this resting. So we're actually now already touching the database. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, now um, let's throw some stuff into the database to actually get some test data in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, a package called Bootstrap, right? And in here, I'm going to add a demo generator. Uh, again, a column class, demo data generator, that seems like a good name. Here we go. Um, and now my demo data generator, um, it will, um, we're going to make it application scoped, just like the repositories, uh, which means we'll only need one of them, right? And what we're going to do is we're like, just like the uh, timetable resource, I'm going to inject all of these repositories because we'll need them to actually add those, those, thing, those um, the test data in there. So I'm, I'm injecting the time slot, the room and the lesson repository in here. So um, then I'm going to create a function here to generate the demo data. And um, it's a bit like this, but uh, I should spell better. Generate, okay. And we're going to have this ob uh, doing observes of the startup event. So it's actually going to listen like, okay, is the, um, is, is Quark starting up? And if it's Quark starting up, then please execute this code. And so, um, and when it starts up, we can actually now add um, some, some test data in, in there, right? Now, um, so we, what we can do is we can say, okay, time slot repository, um, uh, persist, uh, and here we can add a list of uh, the time slots to persist and so forth, right? So um, instead, of, but uh, as it will take a while to write all this, what instead I'm going to do is um, I'm going to, I have some uh, helper files here and one of them is for the demo data generation. Um, I am, this is, this is the one, I'm going to just copy paste this stuff in there and you can see also should make it also transactional. So let's, let's do that in a, in a second. So I'm going to just copy this in there. I'm going to cheat a little bit because writing all this is not interesting for you uh, to follow up. So I'll just throw that in here. All right. And I'm, I'm going to make this transactional. Here we go. So um, let me add, let me remove, fix some of the import statements. All right, and let's make, let me walk you through the code I've just added, um, which is going to look very uh, familiar, I hope. So what, what did I just add? Um, I said, okay, Create me a time slot list, a mutable list, please. Uh, shouldn't actually, it doesn't actually have to be mutable. Um, so, but anyway, yeah. Uh, and here's a list of all the time slots. Um, so we're going to create four time slots for two days, Monday and Tuesday. And we're going to have five hours on a day, the first time up from 8.30 to 9.30 and so forth. Um, I'm also going to create a room list. So in the end, that persisted, of course, with the persist method I just shown you. We're going to add a room list with rooms A, B and C. And we're going to add a lesson list where we add um, a bunch of lessons for the ninth grade, 10 of them, and a bunch of lessons for the 10th grade. This is, this is why I actually use the, the mutable list, but you can argue you can just throw it in one list. It would be more efficient. Um, and uh, well, at this part, let's not do that. Um, let's already assign some of the lessons to give an idea what will happen if we do that. So uh, let's just um, persist these. Okay, let's see how that works out. If we go back to our UI, and we just click the refresh button again. I haven't touched thing. Then it actually turns out. So yes, we have all our time slot lists. Yeah, Monday, you know, all ten of those. We have our rooms, rooms A, rooms B, and room C, and we have our lessons. Um, now this is pretty ugly to actually look at. With this JSON, of course, it's, it's not really meant for humans to read. So let's see if we can make this a little bit more pretty. Let's see if we can make the solve button. Right. So uh, what we did. So now we need a UI, right? Um, so uh, basically, we need to add to add this part to our REST application, right? Um, the problem is um, our UI. Well, we could write it in Kotlin, of course, but then we need to, um, you know, generate JavaScript out of that and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, use a static JavaScript file. Um, that's the easiest approach because. Um, but the thing is, I'm not really a fan of Java writing JavaScript. It's not type safe. So when I write JavaScript, this happens, right? Um, I start, uh, you know, saying a couple of things that are really not suited 
uh, and this video would become R-rated if I actually would code this JavaScript part for you uh, live. So um, instead, uh, I'm, so I'm not going to do that in public. So um, what I'm going to do instead is uh, I'm going to take a little shortcut there. Uh, here's my helper files. I have for the UI, I have a couple of helper files here, which is the uh, and re really just uh, an application already, uh, um, um, a client uh, UI already, just just a client side, right? So a JavaScript file, an HTML file, and an Opta Planner logo to show in there, uh, just to make it a bit more interesting. Um, so where I'm going to drop this? Well, I'm going to go to uh, source main resources, meta inf resources, and if I drop this in here then they will automatically show up all right now let's take a look here so we have our this is the the, uh, the javascript file you can see this yeah, typical javascript uh, i think i've shown enough uh, otherwise um, um, yeah, um, for uh, yeah, otherwise people might run away and then um, here the, um, the html file now in the html file i am using a bit of uh, twitter bootstrap in there and uh, so I want to use some font web jars in there. So we need to add these web jars to our pom.xml here. So I'm going to go into the pom.xml. I'm going to add some dependencies there. And once I do, let me scroll uh, to the bottom here, you'll see that um, I will still not uh, restart Quarkus Dev because I will. I, I intend never to do that. Um, so in, let me just add the, the dependency I want to add. Uh, so uh, these are the ones I want to add. I'll copy them and explain them to you. So these are the ones I want to add. First of all, I'm going to add an extra Quarkus one that I didn't check on on the beginning, but I, I could have, which is the web jars locator, which allows us to use these web jars and automatically expose them uh, to be used from HTML. Um, and then uh, these are the actual web jars that I'm adding. That's Twitter Bootstrap, jQuery, Font Awesome, and MomentJS. MomentJS is something to deal with time on the client side, which is important when you're doing scheduling like tasks, right? Uh, fair enough. Um, let's see what happens if we now go back to our local hosting and we go to the root of that and we do refresh. Um, here we go. Oh, why is it? Okay. So a bit takes a second longer now. And here it is, right? And oh, I still have it on 100%. So here it is, right? So um, what do we see here? Uh, we have our rooms, which are coming from the database, A, B, and C. We have our time slots. We have our unassigned lessons. This is actually quite perfect, right? Let me just prove to you that this is coming from the database. You might not believe this, right? So let me change this room A into room um, uh, some, some, to something else, right? Let's go to Bootstrap here. Let's change this room into room K from Cotton, right? And um, again, I just go here, I just click refresh. And um, now it doesn't have to do the pump stuff anymore, so it goes a bit faster. And this is now room K, as you can see, right? So it, it's that easy. Um, it's think, I think it's time to add a little bit of artificial intelligence to this, because what we want to do now is we want to click the solve button. And when we do, we get a 404, because of course that stuff doesn't exist yet. Right, so we want to make sure that when we click the solve button, these unassigned lessons, math, physics, chemistry, and so forth, get assigned to these four, three rooms and to these uh, time slots. So let's get back um, and let's see what we can do to make that happen. Um, well, we're going to go to the timetable resource here and we're going to add a post for that, um, for that, uh, solver uh, to, to, for that solve thing, right? So we're going to add a solve function. And um, in here, we're going to do the, the magic uh, to actually do, do the sol solving, right? So um, what do we need for this? We need opt -up planner for that. So uh, let's, let's, let's go a bit further in our presentations. So we've just added the database. Um, let's do some AI planning optimization. So what to do that, we're going to add opt -up planner. And um, OptoPlanner needs to know what it can optimize. So this is our domain model. OptoPlanner needs to know that it can actually change the lesson cl class instances. So those 20 lessons we have there in our test data set. And it can, and particularly, it cannot change the subject or teachers. It cannot decide who's going to teach which lesson. 
but not in this case at least, um, but it can decide for each of those lessons when and where those lessons will happen, so the time slot and the room. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a planning annotation on the lesson class because there's something in there that will change and more particularly um, is the planning variables that matter, that's the time slot and room uh, fields. Those two fields will change, so those are the two we we're going to add with a planning anno a variable annotation and you know any, any, any class that has a field that has a planning variable annotation must have a planning entity annotation. So these start out as NULL and after solving they will be non-NULL, right? Not NULL anymore. So let's do that in the code. We go to our lesson here and we're going to say, okay, it's not just a, an entity, but also a planning entity. So this is for the database for Hibernate and this is for um, uh, OptoPlanner, planning entity. And we're going to tell them, okay, so this one is a planning variable. You have to figure out in which room this goes into. Um, and also for the room, all right. Now the problem is that OptoPlan needs to know which time slots can I choose from. It cannot just create new time slots, it has to actually have a list to select time slots from. Same thing with the rooms, it needs to know that the rooms are room K, B and C there, right? So what we're going to do is, we're going to give this a value ref and I'm going to call this the, the time slot range. And this, is, this will map somewhere else to a list of time slots. And um, what we're also going to, what I'm also going to do is, um, and of course this is actually multiple fields, so I'll have to do like this. And the same thing for the rooms. Somewhere we'll need to get the room range. Okay, fair enough. Where are those, uh, where will we get those things from? Well, we'll get those from the timetable class because this actually has a list of all of the time slots, a list of all of the rooms and, and so forth. And um, so this is the ideal place to get these from. So um, here we're going to tell, Opt we're going to say, okay, this is the data set. This is the problem we're going to give to Optomore. It's a, it's a timetable problem. So um, that basically means that once the lessons are assigned, it's also a solution. It's not just a problem, it's also a solution once these lessons are assigned. So we're going to give it the planning solution annotation. And um, so it needs to pick from these lists of time slots. So this is a value range provider, which actually provides all of the time slots that Optoplar can choose from. And we need to give that a name. And the name is of course the time slot range. All right. And let me take a look here. Um, uh, this, this is the ID. So, um, okay, here's the ID, right? And similarly, we are going to do the same for the room list. Here's a list of rooms to pick from. Um, Optifan also needs to know where are the lessons I need to assign, right? So you can't just say any, any kind of lesson that's in memory, actually needs to get a reference to those. So we need to tell them that this is the planning entity collection. So that's actually a list or a collection or an array of all possible playing entities that it needs to assign, right, in the timetable. One more thing we need to do here. Once OptoPlanner goes through these lessons and by one and one by one starts assigning these lessons to a time slot and to a room, picked from these time slot room uh, ranges and room ranges, which are over here, um, all of those lessons will be assigned and that will actually it will need to somehow uh, score that solution, tell how good that solution is, tell if that solution is feasible or not, and if that solution, how, and you know, when the solution is better or worse. And we will represent that by a score, right? And that's called a score, and particularly by a so hard soft score, which means um, hard constraints need to be fulfilled and soft constraints uh, should be fulfilled as much as possible. So, and we're going to start that score out in, in NULL because in the beginning nothing is assigned and we don't know the score. And OptoPanel will actually uh, for us uh, assign them and also tell us what the score is of how good he done his job. So it's like a student who actually grades himself. Mm, okay, interesting. Um, so, that's the model side. Um, besides having the domain, we need some constraints too. So I'm going to add um, package here for the constraints and the constraints well I'm just going to add a single uh, constraint provider so that's something where we will define our constraints in constraints they are like 
no two um, teacher no teacher should have two lessons at the same time no student group should have two lessons at the same time things like that right um, so we're going to call the Scotton class the timetable constraint provider and that one will implement constraint constraint provider here we go provider and of course that will complain because there are certain methods that are unimplemented and we're just going to create uh, an empty uh, one for now right um, I think it's like this let me just check for a second um, that's 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 this is um, so we're going to create an array of right, we're just going to create an empty array for now in a few minutes, I'm going to add uh, constraints in here and we'll see how the solution actually behaves. The artificial intelligence actually changes its output based upon the constraints we will add. We will do that in, in a few minutes because first of all, we need to make sure that all of this is actually hooked into our solving thing. So when we press the solve button, this is called, still nothing happens. So we need to make sure at that moment in time, we're actually solving. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an injection of something called a solver manager. And that's what Auto Planner uses to, um, that's what you use to actually solve a problem, right? So that's for a timetable. And we're going to, and it also has a, uh, you can give it multiple problems. So um, you have the solver manager. So it has two generic types. One is the, the type of problem we're solving, that's our timetable problem, that's the one that has a planning solution annotation, right? And then the other thing is, uh, if you want to give it multiple problems, uh, this is the, um, then we can differentiate them by some sort of ID, and this is the type of the ID. So um, I'm just going to put along here. Okay, so, um, fair enough. Here we have our solve method, so what are we going to do? When we have our solve method, we're going to say, please solve this problem. Um, but we want to see, as Optoplan finds better and better solutions, we immediately want to see those in the UI. We don't want to wait until it's finished. We want to see the intermediate results. So I'm going to actually use solve and listen, which means give me the intermediate solutions too. Now this has three parameters, at least the, the overload method I'm going to use. One is give me the ID of that. So I'm just going to hard code that to that problem ID one, because we're only going to solve one one school at a time right now if you have a multi-tenancy approach then we would you know each tenant would have their own id and we would give that to there and then i need two functions uh, the first function is to actually find the timetable so what i can just do is i can say okay um this method if it's transactional um, let's do that right now um then i can just say okay this get timetable that's the first method and then the, uh, this will add. so the first method is to uh, load the problem. The second method is to save the problem. And so this is the one that um, I'm going to create a function for function save of a timetable. Right. Here we go. Now. Um, it's uh, it's important to understand that um, well this this won't work to find uh, the get timetable because it needs to find by ID so um, in, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to find by the find by ID thing here I get an ID right uh, uh, a job ID which is that long this is that one lot one L there and so I can just return um, a get timetable. That, that's actually good enough for me and this will one will return uh, a timetable right so now i can use this one so this is just a wrap around that function which transforms it from actually having the knowing the id just getting the one timetable that we have um okay um, and maybe solver manager should support such a function too just to make it easier so we don't need to write this boilerplate code if uh, if we don't do multi-tenant solving but that's an interesting to think about Anyway, once we have our uh, timetable um, available here, 
then uh, this will be called every time Optoptimer finds a new best solution, in which case we will want to restore those lessons and particularly those assignments of time shift and so forth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a for loop um, in of the time table lesson list. All right. So for each lesson in that lesson list, I'm going to look for the attached lesson. If you're familiar with JPA, that basically means that you're going to go into the lesson repository. So these lessons are not attached anymore in, in JPA terminology, which means that any change we do to them do not get stored into the database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find uh, by ID the, um, the lesson that is, uh, you know, the, um, and the lesson that's assigned, right? And then uh, it's a type mismatch, of course, I need to make sure that it is, um, uh, it's null safe. The ID itself can also be null, so, um, but I know by, by when Optopner gives us a lesson list, that's each of those lessons in that lesson list will come from the database, from the find by ID method, and therefore will have an ID, right? So it's safe to do this check. I also know that, um, I know that these lessons are in the database right now, so I'm just going to, for now, just uh, just you know make do the if uh, you know, skip the if check, which is dangerous, of course, in a real life environment, especially the second one. You might want to do an extra check on that and and, and be able be able to deal with that condition if, it, if that's not the case. And luckily, uh, Kotlin warns us for that. So then we're going to take our uh, attached lesson. We're going to take the time slot. And we're going to assign that to the time slot of our uh, lesson we just, uh, you know, we're saving, right? And we're going through all of the lessons to save them. Uh, similarly, we're doing the same for the room. All right. Okay, here we go. And now we're finished. So now what happens is when we click the solve button, uh, it will call solve and listen, which will first load the problem by our find ID uh, find method. We'll just get the timetable from the database, and then when we're finished, it will put the, it will save the database in, in the, uh, it will save uh, each of the lessons of that timetable in the database by basically just uh, saving the time slot and room assignments. Uh, let's take a look at how that works out. Um, okay, it didn't crash. That's a good thing. Um, well, it actually probably did crash because where is my test data? Let's take a look. Uh, okay, we're getting an error here. So that, that happens. And the nice thing about this is that when this happens, you are getting a nice thing. So here is it's an, a good a war, a warning, good error message that which must help you. And here it says that the solution class must have one member with the planning score annotation. Because I forgot something. Um, OptoPlanner needs to know that this score is actually the score for this thing and it needs to know it needs to have an annotation for that and I forgot to tell him that so let me just tell him that all right here we go planning score uh, let's go back here and uh, let's hope this time it's better yes so um, it starts up at least let's click the solve button da -da -da -da. what will happen there right not found oh, okay that's not good um, of course we need to make sure that this uh, post method over here um, actually has a path, so let's add a path there and call it solve. Um, because if you look at, if you click the solve button, it's actually going to go to that uh, dash solve thing. So let's see what's happening now. It's actually solving, good. And uh, okay, again, another error. <laughs> hmm, no worries, let's take a look at what the problem is. Uh, okay. The problem at this is that the context is not active. That's because it's not a transaction. So the save method should, of course, also be transaction, right? So uh, third time's a charm. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Let's try again. Okay, let's click the solve button. Does it actually assign these things to a lesson? And it does. It's just assigned every single lesson to the first room, room K, and to the first time slot. So it actually did solve it, but there are no constraints yet. So OptoPlanner can do whatever it wants. And of course, uh, it, it basically gave us the worst possible schedule. Um, so it's time to start adding a few constraints into this. So what do we go back? We go back to the uh, constraint provider here. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I want a room conflict uh, constraint. 
and I'm just going to give back the constraint factory in that and I'm going to create this method, right? Here we are. So this will create um, um, a constraint for us. So um, you can do this in, in, in a simpler form, but this is actually a form that will give you incremental score calculation, which is going to be a huge um, uh, uh, performance gain, right? And OptoPlanner will look at very many, many combinations. So any combinations of the solution, it will look at any combinations of lessons being assigned to rooms and times that it will look at. You will need to score those, and then uh, it will try to find the best one out of those. Um, in a very, very smart way. It will not look at 1% of the solutions, not even 1% one of 1% one, 1 of, 1 of the solutions because the search pace is so high, but it will look in a very intelligent way into as little, uh, into lots of solutions um, to come up with in as little time as possible the best possible solution. Um, and this API will actually help drive up the speed for that so it can look at more solutions, which is always better, of course, right? more solutions per, per second. So what are we going to do? It's very much like SQL. We're going to say, um, I'm going to look for a lesson. Yeah, right. uh, so I'm going to look for a lesson. Uh, and let's just say we have a simple version. Oh, okay, this is um, uh, a, a bit too... Um, uh, so this is the correct syntax, of course. Um, and then what we're going to say is, okay, um, Let's just say if we have a lesson, we're going to penalize that, and then we can say what kind, what is, what is it? It's a room conflict, right? And we, we just say okay, it's a hard, soft score, uh, one hard, for example, right? We want, we don't want this to happen. Um, this won't give it much effect. Um, and by the way, this constraint factory is empty. Um, this won't give much effect because. Um, it will basically select every lesson, and for each lesson we will, we will use a point, but no matter how it assigns those lessons, that will actually not make any difference. So that's not what we want. What we want to check is when we have a lesson and we join that with another lesson, just like in SQL, All right? Um, now we have two lessons, and uh, then for those two lessons, they actually have uh, the uh, same uh, the same uh, time slot, right? Um, and also the, the equal, the same room. So they're in the same room at the same time, right? Then we have a problem, right? So uh, then we have a conflict. So every time OptoPlanner assigns two uh, lessons in the same room at the same time, Time, it's going to get hit on the head. It's going to this penalized method will, will hit it on the head and it will get a hard constraint, right? So um, let's take a look what happens if we uh, now go back to the application again. Just a second later, we can test this out. We press the solve button, and this looks a lot better, right? Because now every lesson is assigned to a, there's no two lessons in the same room at the same time. Is this a feasible schedule? It's not. Why not? Well, okay, let's take a look at Alan Turing. So let's take a look at the teachers here. Uh, Alan Turing over here has to, has, has to teach two lessons at the same time on Monday morning. This is not a feasible schedule. So let's go back to the code here and let's actually also check for teacher conflicts. So I'm just going to duplicate this code now for uh, so it's a bit faster. So um, we're going to call this uh, a teacher conflict, right? Same principle. Um, when we have a lesson and another lesson which are in the same time slot but now for the same teacher then we're going to penalize this then we have a teacher conflict notice how these two constraints are isolated from each other that's a good thing so you can turn them off and on uh, individually and also um, you can you know work on one uh, in isolation which is a really really good thing because otherwise it gets quite complex quite fast anyway we have this now let's take a look as if we press the refresh button and we press the solve button um, all right and we now see that room wise this looks good um, no two lessons in the same room at the same time it's a bit strange we have three lessons at the same time we'll, 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 we'll take a look at it in a minute teacher wise this looks good no teacher has two lessons at the same time uh, but the student group wise uh, that's why we had three lessons at the same time uh, the 10th grade has to do physics and spanish at the same time so again, same solution. We do. We now also not just, just check for 
for uh, uh, teacher conflicts, but also for student group conflicts. So this is now a student group. And then we have a, and then we can simply add this uh, constraint in there. All right. And if we jump back to the UI here, we should now have our first feasible schedule. So feasible means no hard constraints are broken. It means that we can actually execute this plan. So room wise, this looks good. Teacher wise, this looks feasible. I'm not saying it looks good, it looks feasible. And the student wise, this looks uh, also uh, feasible and good. So teacher wise, it actually doesn't look uh, good. Why not? Matt uh, Alan Turing, the poor guy, has to have a teacher lesson, then has an hour where he can twiddle his thumbs, teacher lesson, twiddle his thumbs, teacher lesson, twiddle his thumbs. And it's really, really, really a terrible schedule uh, for him. Uh, so we can actually fix that. Um, we can actually go back into the constraints, add soft constraints, and then OptiPlanner will take this into account. And if you want to see that, please take a look at the source code of this. We add a bunch more soft constraints to actually improve the lives of the teachers and the student groups, uh, to improve the quality of education by basically scheduling them better. No, uh, you know, and you can easily add your own. For example, no, um, no gym class after lunch or at least try to avoid it, right? No three hours of math after each other on Monday morning, right? No student will survive that, um, or at least like that, right? So uh, it's pretty easy to do all this. The code of this is available. Just go to um, uh, the, the OptiPlanner Quick Starts repository. The link is below on this video. Um, and then you can run this yourself, um, or you can you know see how we've written it from, from scratch. So um, I would like to say thank you for listening. So this is the URL if you want to try the, uh, try out this code right now. Um, you can also even build a native uh, image of this with Maven uh, Quark is minus D native. That takes a bit longer. You need to have Graal installed and stuff like that. Uh, but that means you get a native executable. So um, instead of a, a you know bytecode that you run, need to run on a JVM. Um, and here's the links to the projects: optiplanner.org, quarkz.io. And of course, Scotland, uh, where we've written all of this thing into. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to post a comment or to uh, ask on the OptiPlanner uh, dev mailing list or uh, Stack Overflow or something like that. Uh, so, um, thank you for listening.